Enos will return next Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock, 7 Central and Mountain Time on most of these stations. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. This portrait of Jean Grey, the Phoenix, is one of the ones I did for a series of single frame uh, mock-up kind of covers for the Marvelocity book where my concept was it would work like an accordion when you open up the book getting past the initial Captain America cover you would fold it out and you get Iron Man and character after character after character and it allowed me then to do multiple Marvel character portraits uh, Phoenix being one of the most primary Marvel concepts because her storyline back in 1980 the invention of that character that maturation of Jean Grey into the Phoenix was one of the best storylines in the history of comics and stands out as one of the most important female superheroes. Well, there's Tom Pyre, and here I am, John Suntress. Welcome back again, everybody. It's Word Balloon Live, the comic book conversation show. Tom was just uh, delighting me with some boxing talk before we got started. I'm always happy to talk. He's like, hey, I got a copy of Boxiana. And I'm like, oh, that must be your new graphic novel. No, he's talking about this fantastic book from, was it the 1800s, Tom, Pierce Egan? Oh, uh, it was, uh, I think it was the 18th century. Wow, 1700s. Oh, my God. Or maybe early 1800s. Uh, like the, the the first great boxing scribe, unless you count whoever was uh, doing, you know, the Greek uh, times and stuff with, with the Cestus. Oh, he's wonderful. He wrote about the whole culture surrounding it, like the parades that would last for days to these, that would unroute to these boxing matches and how they were stratified by class and how the matches they were going to were illegal anyway. But uh, if it was, it's a beautiful, beautiful read. That's part of the charm, man. Absolutely. Tom, of course, uh, one of the big uh, cogs in Ahoy Comics. And, of course, we appreciate his long uh, writing uh, writing prior to uh, Ahoy. But, uh, dude, I'm telling you, you guys keep killing it. Really, really fun, uh, great stuff. And I, I love talking to creators like yourself and Jamal Igel and Mark Russell and Stuart Moore. And I, am I hearing correctly, Paul Cornell uh, doing yeah. that Ahoy book uh, for you guys very soon? Yeah, absolutely. That's it. That's a, a cool one. It's called Con and On, and it takes place at a uh, suspiciously San Diego-like comic book convention over a period of years, and we follow many years, and we follow the this cast, this big cast. Not everyone knows each other, but but they have relationships which change over the years, and it's a lovely book. Kind of a look at uh, you know well obviously a convention but is it kind of a look at the business as well and it's look at comics the people in it uh, a little bit of TV and the people in it you know genre TV and um, a little bit of uh, people I'm sure we're all familiar with who uh, mainly go to conventions to drink <laughs> I, I tend I tend to see them in the mirror <laughs> but uh, uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful book. Really is is, is Ithacon uh, going to be your first convention of the year? Have you done one prior to this? It's going to be my first convention since COVID. So, wow. Um, I got uh, I I got it was very easy for me to shun crowds for three years. <laughs> it was easier than I thought it would be, but at my age, I I like to cheat a little to stay alive. And uh, but anyway, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's um, it's I started going to Ithaca. Ithaca is the second oldest show in the country, the second oldest comic book convention after San Diego. And I started going to it in the mid 80s and uh, where I got to see people like Julia Schwartz. And I got to be uh, friends with Roger Stern. And that led directly to me getting a comic book career because he was so helpful and getting me in touch with the right people and such. 
That's amazing. Roger, of course, also going to be at Ithacan as uh, they celebrate the 30th anniversary of the uh, death of Superman, Doomsday Story. And mm -hmm. that's, that's going to be very cool. And uh, a lot of the uh, Ahoy brethren, I know, are going to be there as well. And I know you guys like to have fun on your panels. And uh, I would imagine there's going to be some fun giveaways and uh, crazy, uh, crazy stuff going on. Last year, um, we were thinking about going and then one of us got COVID and we're like, no, we're not. None of us are going. <laughs> and um, so they had a there was a Ahoy Comics panel planned and none of us were there. So Mike Gold ran, who was an editor at DC when I worked there. A sure. You know, and he, uh, I guess he just loves the Hawaii comics and reads them all and stuff. And he, he, he did the panel. So I'll get to thank him this year because he'll be there too. Oh, that's great. I just saw him a couple of weeks ago at uh, C2E2. Oh, yeah. And they had a bunch of the first comic uh, people together. Linda Lensman was there. Joe Staten was there. Oh, Alex cool. Wald. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of Hillary Barta. It was a lot of fun. He and, put together uh, a real gang at that company. Absolutely, man. Well, and truly, man, the same could be said for what you guys are doing at Ahoy. You've got, you know, a lot of my favorite people there, including the ones that I've already mentioned, plus Stuart Moore, if yeah. I haven't mentioned Stuart. Um, you know, I, I and and new voices as well. And I think um uh, it was it was needed. Every time I talk to you guys about Ahoy, it's um you guys do humor right. And uh, that's great, man, because we need we need more good, smart humor humor comics. And it's, it's nice to know that it's in the hands of uh, people who know how to do it. Thank you very much. No question, man. Uh, you know you had me at hello, you and Jamal Igo, when you guys uh, created The Wrong Earth. And, uh, <laughs> Dragonfly, man, and Dragonfly. And mm -hmm. uh, it's such a, a, a really fun concept. We've talked about it before on Word Balloon. And, uh, you know, the give them the short pitch of uh, Dragonfly. Well, the short pitch is that they're uh, parallel universes. And... On one Earth, one Earth is kind of like a uh, comics code era comic book where the heroes are all upstanding and flag saluting. And um, <laughs> the uh, other one is kind of like a post comic code Earth where the heroes are uh, ultra violent and vengeance seeking. And so so there are two versions of the same hero Dragonfly Man on the comics code Earth. And Dragonfly on the postcoder, and they get trapped in each other's worlds in the first series. And uh, it's a very difficult adjustment for both of them. Can we expect more uh, Wrong Earth uh, stories coming? Um, this September, it's going to be the fifth anniversary of Ahoy, which makes it the fifth anniversary of Wrong Earth. And uh, uh, it seems like a big number to us. So we're going to. Yeah. We're going to put out some specials. We're going to do, uh, among them is going to be a two-part Wrong Earth special that will lead into the next series. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, again, like you said, Comics Code or Silver Age. Imagine you're, uh, a very clean-cut uh, Silver Age hero finding himself in the grim and gritty uh, post-80s, uh, early 90s uh, world of, of death and guns and realism. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, and, and vice versa. Suddenly that grim and gritty hero is in the sanitized Silver Age world and all the all the silly characters and stuff and everything as far as villains and right. they're not they're not expecting Dirty Harry to show up basically. I'd say that he had an easier job. The one who <laughs> the really dirty guy who went to the Happy Earth had a much easier job. It's kind of like Indiana Jones with the gun when he's going to fight <laughs> the guy with the big right. sword. It's just bang. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's great, man. Truly, I, I've loved the concept. I've loved uh, the the short stories and the and the volumes that you've done so far on Wrong Earth. It's a it's it's really a great idea, and uh, and you guys execute it really well. Like I said, so so that's cool. And we got and like you said, we've got um, we've got uh, Paul Conrad uh, Paul Cornell's book. Excuse me, as I call Paul. Yeah, that's coming up. And yeah, we're so excited about that. that. And we have neat. another uh, uh, Marika Cresta is the artist, and she's wonderful. I don't know if you've seen anything by her, but she is she's uh even over this series developing into an artist even more wonderful and uh uh it's uh it's just a terrific series on on many levels that's we have, cool. uh, another series of black's myth which is 
Eric Palicki, Wendell Cavalcanti doing the uh, the sort of noir about a detective, private detective who's a werewolf. I had uh, I had Eric kind of talk about that a, a few weeks ago. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, that's that's another really great one. Are there other genres that you're going to tie comedy into that you haven't done yet? I mean, you know how how I mean, obviously the possibilities are there, but has anyone come to you with any sort of left to field genre yet? Well, everything is kind of high concept. Everything we do, everything that catches our eye usually has, like when you describe the idea to people, they're amused. Um, uh, we were talking the other day about maybe, we have a, we did Edgar Allan Poe's snifter books, which were like this sort of cross between creepy and mad. I like to think of it. It's yeah, just, and Gold Key, like almost like the old uh, Boris Karloff and uh, yeah. Twilight Zone Gold Key books. Go on. Yeah, and but... We were talking the other day about thinking about uh, a long form horror comedy, which we haven't quite done. And um, although we do have we do have a project that could fit that description, but uh, maybe something with more mummies and werewolves. And, <laughs> and to me, horror is just like when I was a kid. You, when you're a kid and you have like a jigsaw puzzle with big pieces, and it's got Frankenstein and a graveyard with the wolf man and to me that's horror i'm i'm so with you man really exactly that universal monster absolutely thing and 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 were you a hammer guy as well the british stuff less so but yeah i'm yeah. i'm with you absolutely you know uh again forgive me for mentioning uh the con i was just at a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. but i got to do sven Gulli's panel i'll moderate his panel and Love yeah he's a, he's a buddy he's uh you know being in Chicago, Tom, I've I've been watching Rich since he started uh, when he took over his son of Sven Gulli back in '79, and the original Sven Gulli before him. So no, I I uh, I wouldn't call myself necessarily a monster kid, but those kind of Saturday afternoons and uh, Saturday night um, UHF channel screenings of uh, the good stuff and the bad stuff was certainly uh, part of my diet back uh, when I was a kid. So we had we had a horror host who was a vampire named Baron Damon here in Syracuse. And Baron I, what? Baron what? Damon, like D-A-E-M-O-N, like Damon. <laughs> and I would have taken a bullet for him. I loved him so much. And he uh uh he got so popular, he got really popular with kids. So they, they gave him a kiddie show where he would show Flash Gordon chapters. And he had a spaceship, and you could go on his show and sit in the spaceship, which was really several rows of folding chairs. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> but the thing about it is, who lets their kid go into outer space with a vampire? So he was the vampire on the sci-fi show. I'm yeah, he was the vampire always. We loved him. He Hilarious. was so popular with kids. I think parents were getting a little mad that the kids were like, screaming to stay up and see him so they gave him the kitty show that's and, awesome yeah so yeah, yeah. when then, uh go on continue tom well they had a fire at the station and his his costumes got ruined and they had a new manager uh who was a evangelical christian and oh no aaron Damon went for you know his costume replacement and the guy went nah wow and that was the end of baron de Wow, that's <laughs> crazy, man. Rich had a Svenguli had a moment when um, the UHF channel was bought by uh, Fox and they didn't want to continue the show. And but he, they still had to pay his contract, so they made him a weekend weatherman. And he wasn't in the makeup doing the weather, but he, you know, and I'm like, how was that? And he's like, you know, you made the best of it. What else can you do? You know, you gotta, you gotta earn the check. But uh, I'm so happy for him that he's, you that's know. Crazy. Beloved oh. nationally and everything, and yeah, great guy. Couldn't happen to him. I should add, just like on SCTV, the guy who played Baron Damon was an actual newsman for the station. He was an actual reporter. Count Floyd. Yeah. No Flaherty, absolutely, man. Well, that's a. You're right, man. That's the thing. I um. There, I, uh, there's another local news guy who's the weather guy, and uh, for the CBS uh, TV station here. And prior to that, he was the Kitty Show host. And I'm like, so did you learn meteorology? He's like, of course not. He goes, no. He goes, you know, but I've been doing it so long now that I know it. 
And, you know, the, the wire services, I mean, Tom, you and I could do a weather show. I got to be on no disrespect to any meteorologists out there who do the real science. And the really great weathermen are like amazing. We have a Chicago guy that's on our WGN station and they spend 10 minutes on weather because he's that good. And everyone, oh. especially the way the weather changes in Chicago, it's like, no, this guy is indispensable. And other general managers is like, do we need 10 minutes of weather? And the answer is, Everybody changes the channel from other local news to just watch his weather forecast. What do you think? And he's oh, like, wow. all right. <laughs> Fine. Wow. So, yeah, man. Uh, here, Magic K, great question. In the 90s, Morrison, Mark, Mil Mark Wade, Mark Miller, and you were uh, in the unpublished Superman 2000 project. How would that impact you if that project got published at that time? Tell me about this. I don't know about this. Uh, what would Tell me what you can. Really, it was... Grant and Mark and Mark, who cooked up like a way forward for Superman that incorporated a lot of the, kind of the feelings you would get from Silver Age comics, but not old timey conceits. And, um, I don't know why my name was attached to it. I did nothing. And I don't believe if it had sold, I don't believe I would have been along. But my name was on it for a while, and it lives in history as. I am the ringleader of the Superman project, but I wrote not one word of this thing. <laughs> and the reason they put my name on it, I think, was just that they loved me and they thought it might be fun to do it with me. Would you have edited, do you think? or oh, I wasn't an editor anymore. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was I trying to figure out. The writers in one, in one parallel universe and in another one I wouldn't have been. It's hard to know how it would have gone. Man, but I could read it, and it was absolutely wonderful. There's a there's a moment Superman's commitment to uh, life and his code against killing is so strong that Grant wrote this little paragraph where uh, he's he he encounters a drunk, and the he sees with his microscopic vision that the drunk's breath is killing millions of bacteria. And he says, there's nothing I can do to save them. That's awesome. It wow. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, man. And that's how far Superman thinks, I understand. Regarding the wrong Earth, um, have we seen beyond Dragonflies and Dragonfly Man's sidekick, have we seen other heroes? We saw another there in volume uh, two, if you don't count the Dragonfly, Dragonfly Man book. We go to another. They both end up on a on a third planet together, trying to work together, and it's difficult. And there's a dragon fly there as well. I think he okay man dragon fly. <laughs> we do meet him, and uh, it, when that series ended, uh, they were they were all stuck on that world, and um, so we're proceeding from there. But uh, so no. Like, and again, because we're just talking about a Superman thing, like no Superman cipher in... No, no, I, I kind of felt so far that that would just be a distraction from the point if we had a lot of them. And um, yeah. uh, I like how, I like how sometimes in old comics, they just never refer to anyone else. It's like... It's like Martian Manhunter can't get back to Mars, but next week he's in the Justice League and Superman can take him there in five minutes. But then he's back in Detective Comics and he can't get back to Mars. <laughs> You're not wrong. And that's, that's, that's the junk I grew up with and I'll, I'll fight for it. That's awesome, man. And I, you know, of course, we all love uh, your, your run on Our Man and introducing the future Our Man as you did and also the, the whole legacy of, of the Tylers. And that, you know, I I always was fascinated by that original Rex Tyler. Uh, I guess it's brown, uh, but I always thought it's black and gold, that original Golden Age costume. Yeah. And, like you know, that if you go back and read the original Iron Man stories, it does affect him kind of like alcohol. Like it makes him more, not only does it give him super strength, but it takes away some of his inhibitions, which I think is something that, uh, could have been explored more when he was brought back in the modern age. I thought that was the, kind of the special thing about him. I agree. And yeah, we got a little bit of it with uh, when uh, they did the Golden Age story, Paul Smith and uh, James Robinson. 
mm-hmm. and you saw that, you know, I'm not an addict. I'm not an addict. Clearly he was, you know, yeah. No, that's good stuff. It also reminds me of uh, when Denny O'Neill did Legends of the Dark Knight and they introduced the concept of the Venom drug mm-hmm. that Bane obviously later used, but obviously when Batman was doing it, it was like he lost his inhibitions and, you know, beats the hell out of a few criminals, even stops wearing the costume. And it's just, yeah. you know, this menace in yeah. you know, guy, civilian guys, basically. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty that cool. was great stuff. But yeah. I'm attracted to the Iron Man set, the original Iron Man setup where it's a drug and he loses his inhibitions and there's nothing wrong with it. Well, that was the simplicity of the Golden Age, you know, back then and yeah. stuff. Were those in an adventure? Was that the... Boy. Yeah, That's sorry, man. I think it might be adventure. Okay. Because I... I I'm I'm always fascinated by in the 40s and in the 50s the Johnny Quicks and the Hour Men and all these other second tier heroes that were you know doing the eight page stories and stuff behind you know Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman, so you know yeah I've gotten interested in Sandman and Sandy the Cur- the Kirby version lately because um, along with like the Black Terror that Mark Meskin did there's like yes there's there's just this subset of hero masked heroes who have kids sidekicks for no reason. And just because they think it'll sell. And I love this. You know, John shamed me. He's doing that star girl mini series that looks back at a bunch of uh, both, I think created for the story, but also real golden age sidekicks. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know if he was kidding me or not, but he's like, oh, you don't remember Cherry Bomb with the human bomb? And I'm like, was that real? And he's like, John, come on. And I don't know, because they did kind of who's who uh, stories about all these side or, you know, um, info pages at the back of, of each uh, mini, uh, the, the miniseries as it was coming out. And I'm like, is he messing with us? I'm like, I don't know, because you could see a bunch of these just being teenage knockoff sidekicks as they were and stuff. What is what is uh, Dragonfly Man's? Uh, I'm forgetting his character, sidekick's name. Stinger. Of course, Stinger. And that's fun, man. Those two versions of Stinger, you know, Bert, Bert Ward Stinger has no idea what the hell's going on. And I don't know, I guess um, uh, the kid from Third Rock and the Sun that was in the third Dark Knight movie and stuff, he's kind of the, uh, I think, uh, a- allegory to uh, to Stinger, you know, Dragonfly Stinger and everything. Yeah, he, well, he's, he's the... The, the the Earth Omega one is kind of late Dick Grayson where he's like where he, he's always mad at Batman. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that, you know. That's uh, that's going to Hudson University. They filled his head with all that uh, lousy that uh, junk. Exactly, like little superhero theory. See, Tom, I'm telling you, man. I was reading that stuff too, early '70s. Frank Robbins, uh, guys like that, writing Batman and drawing Batman and stuff. It was. Uh, those are those are great. Those in the bathroom oh, solo stuff. Congresswoman uh, Barbara Gordon, Dick Grayson uh, on a motorcycle with his acoustic guitar strapped to the back of it. <laughs> I once, um, I don't think they'll mind me talking about this. I'm slow, so I did this too late. Uh, when, when the Batman '66 comic was coming out, I got this inspiration. And I pitched them Robin 68, where he um, goes to college, grows his hair a little long, and has like Robin. He has those 70s Robin adventures, but with the sensibility of Batman 66. And uh, and people really liked it, but they were just getting to the end of their whole Batman 66 program. We couldn't do it. I was just too late. God, you you should pitch it as an animated movie. And God, you know, Burt Ward can still like sound like Dick Grace, you know, Dick Grace. Gosh, He's yes. <laughs> and especially 68. That's fantastic, man. Summer, well, 67 maybe was the summer of love. Yeah, 68 so, was more like demonstrations and yes, top speeding kids and stuff like that. So, you know, Dick, are you going to the rally? Gosh, yes. Exactly. Stuff like that. <laughs> stuff like that. And then, you know, the Joker takes over the college or something. It's just, Everything would have to do with the university. What little we got of Dick as a teenager in Batman 66, the TV series, was always great, man. You know, and when uh, Leslie Gore 
was Catwoman's little sidekick, and she's singing California Nights to him and everything, to his picture. Oh my God, outstanding! It so is. I love that. Come on, man! Absolutely. See, that's what I'm saying, Tom. I mean, you know, we we watch the same stuff. We like the same stuff. Clearly, clearly. You know what surprised me? There was always, um, I mean, with the exception of the Green Hornet and the Lone Ranger, well, and Superman as well. The superheroes that were on old time radio, um, you know, they they. Uh, and I mean that's those are three great examples that obviously endured, but um, you know I know there was a Blue Beetle mm -hmm. radio series and um, and I, I'm not sure you know well and I know too ironically even like some of the even more obscure heroes like the Green Llama there I know there was a radio series of the Green Llama as well. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Wow, you know I know that from uh, listening to uh, good Philip Marlowe detective old time radio shows. And they're and they're doing commercials for the Green Llama, and I'm like, wow! I didn't know wow, that. really? Huh? So yeah, it was that he was even on like CBS or whatever? It's like, oh my god, crazy! I gotta hear some Green Llama. Do you listen to any of the old time radio stuff? I mean, I think the kid the kid shows are kid shows, and it's like, all right, whatever. Although there's probably some great germs of an opportunity to make good parodies of Tom Corbett's Space Patrol and some of these <laughs> other things, but I really do love the detective shows and the movie adaptations I always find really interesting as well. Like Lux radio theater when they will, will do a big Hollywood movie and all of a sudden it's the Maltese Falcon, but it's Edward G Robinson instead of Bogart, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I love, I like that stuff a lot. I like it a lot. Do you ever hear the Babe Ruth um, show? The Babe Ruth it, show. Is his real show. It's the one where an actor plays him. Oh, William Bendix? Is it the... No, no, it's not William Bendix. Tell me about this. Wait a minute. I may not have heard this. It's a 15-minute show, and every episode a kid gets in trouble and Babe gets him out. That's fantastic. It's 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 easy to find, like at archive.org. The only trouble with it is that they place it in, like... every Everybody places this show in, like, the 1930s. And you can hear from the audio quality that it's post-World War II. Okay. And wow. There's even references to the war, but people think they mean World War I, but I'm sure they mean World War II. But, so I, I can't get any informa real information about the show. Oh, wow. But it but Babe is always like hitting home runs, and then there's like I don't know, I got for kids, and one of them's in trouble, and he goes and fixes it with him. And, uh, uh, it's, he likes to help a bad kid be good often. Of course. <laughs> That's amazing. That's like that... Uh... Oh God, the uh, Kevin Bacon movie where he's the student director that's getting his first big break making a movie, and the guy's like, you know what? He goes, I got focus groups. You know what? Everybody loves heroes like Abraham Lincoln and Babe Lincoln, and they're Babe Babe Ruth, and they have the they have the fake movie Abe and the Babe. And, <laughs> and Lincoln Lincoln's whittling a bat for him to hit home runs and stuff. <laughs> that's great. Um, oh, here we go. My another a good question. Another question for Magic K. Do you think Superman is too overpowered to write? Do you think he should stick with his Golden Age power uh, set, which he couldn't even fly? That's right. He leapt rather than flew, rather than flew. That's right. He did. One of my favorite things about Superman, and I, I, I'm going to do this someday with a superhero, and I did it a little bit with one, but I love the fact that they just weren't that specific about his power so they could adjust it over time, which you never see anymore. But it worked out well for Superman. It really did. But um, I'm in the school that says, you know, make him as powerful as you want, as powerful as you can. I read a Silver Age Superman story the other night, and it was the story hinged not on Superman being the most powerful person in the story, but being the most decent person in the story. And they often did hinge on that. And they're challenges to his power challenges to his decency and uh i think a lot of people will say well he can't be killed you know how do you read about somebody who can't be killed and i suggest that there are uh, uh, uh dramatic problems that are not death and we can write great stories about them greg Reco would always tell me um you can't you know bullets bounce off him but you can break his heart that's exactly right. That's yeah, exactly you know, right. no, I agree. I, I love the idea of a guy who can fly through space without an oxygen supply and 
move a planet out of orbit and fly through the sun to do his laundry <laughs> <laughs> while he's wearing it. And uh, I just, I mean, that's what I grew up with. So that's probably why I love it. On, on the other hand, I also loved the George Reeves TV Superman who could barely do anything. <laughs> crash, crash through the wall, bullets yeah. bounce off them, yeah. plunks the uh, villain's heads, yeah. unties yeah. Lawrence, and they fly away. Fly in a straight line. Yep, I agree. Oh, this is hilarious. Uh, Duke, and I completely agree with you, Duke, but I'll put your posts up here. He's overpowered. Also, he's not relatable in any way. I I couldn't I couldn't disagree more. If, uh, he's, yeah. if he's not relatable to you, I suggest there are versions of him that you'd like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he used to fly through the sun. That's how he uh, cleaned his costume. That's right. Pushing planets. I remember when he... Yeah. Thought he was dying, and he, with his heat vision, he uh, put a message on the moon that you could see. And uh, yeah, that I was against. I thought that was the most narcissistic thing anyone ever did. That we're <laughs> going to see his message every time we look at the moon forever. That was that's like something Trump would do. <laughs> he, um, in the story, well, I'm, should I spoil it? I'm going to spoil it. It's like from 60 years ago. Oh, you can spoil it, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he, you know, some message about do good unto others in that way every man can be a Superman. And he thought he was dying. So he signed it Superman with a hyphen Clark Kent. And uh, then he found out he wasn't dying. So, of course, he had to go back and obliterate the Clark Kent. <laughs> but the rest is still up there. It's definitely still a billboard, like you said. That's right. Superman. Right. Not dying. dying. Oh, no. <laughs> I love it. Everyone loves my message on the moon. Come on. I love it. That's fantastic, <laughs> man. I can see that happening, sadly. Um, they used that gag twice, too. I found it in a 50s comic. I forget. What you know, was. they would do that a lot. There were like rerun comics, and it's, and I suppose the feeling was we're not going to, you know, they didn't even think about reprinting this stuff until around uh, 1960, whenever they, they did that first 80 page giant i talked to marty pasco about that back in the day right and, and they also thought well you know you're done reading comics after three four years so no one will have seen this story before yeah i know it's crazy man are there because again wrong earth is so on the nose or and uh as far as the aesthetic of a batman 66 idea but certainly different enough are there marvel silver age versions that ever occur to you and could be you know wrong earthized in the same way that you have with dragonfly man well i think about all of them when i write dragonfly man i mean it sounds like a particular tone of a particular thing but but um really i mean read like an early iron man he's a he, he makes munitions building so I'm like patriotism you know <laughs> you're not wrong <laughs> i mean yeah got to save pepper right so right. um oh this is interesting um which one do you prefer more hmm. Lex luther as a mad scientist or as a businessman villain i have i have to be honest and this doesn't make me look good but i only like things that came out when i was a kid <laughs> I mean, I like that's not true. I like things the most that came out when I was a kid. And so he was a man, he was a mad scientist then. He was the guy who you could put him in a jail cell and he could like take the filament out of his light bulb and shake it in a glass with his aspirin and make an in invisibility serum. <laughs> and escape from jail. It was pretty good stuff. The when he became like the most powerful guy in Metropolis. At the moment, I felt like it made him too much like Dr. Doom to me. Like, this, this, like It took away some of his individuality. But I think, looking back, it was right for the times to do that. And uh, you didn't, whatever age I was then, that's probably not who you were calling for. I, uh, you know, the one thing was that there were a lot more, and again, I suppose, you know, it was a four-color world as far as making Superman. But also just the, the, the fact that a lot of the villains were goofier, and with the exception of Luther using his brain and Brainiac and a few, you know, powerful from a strength standpoint villains, you know, you got more like Toy Man and 
some of these other heroes or villains rather that you know it's like all right that's a nuisance good lord when the when's he as you said earlier as we said earlier why don't we just vaporize him or whatever you know it's like it's problem solved of course he'd never do that but part of the fun of going back and reading comics that came out when you were a kid is that they seemed really serious to you then like flash's rogues gallery seemed really serious and threatening and then you go back and look and they're like they're just you know it's a guy with a cold gun who talks to himself all day it's like, it just doesn't seem like that much of a threat um duke i i i i'll let uh, tom answer this question what is lex Luthor's problem with superman it's changed over the years it 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 all it, it depends on what generation you're reading and um sometimes i think mo more recently it's that um he's just not comfortable with anyone having more power than he would and uh uh, he also uh, is kind of this weird planetary nationalism where he counts Superman's alien uh, Kryptonian ethnicity against him. Yeah. And uh, uh, so there's you can always find a way. When I was a kid, he blamed Superboy for his hair loss. <laughs> and uh, they figured that was enough of a origin story for kids <laughs> well, I it, you know i i i'm with you man i was reading those superboy stories absolutely and he yeah. started off as superman's good friend or superboy's good friend and then yeah superboy uh inadvertently um his super breath caused chemicals to blow on luther's head and it made his hair fall out and that's that's where it started but i i kind of like as you said about the modern version where you know think of a, a steve jobs or really an elon musk that with with more actual ability than maybe Mr. <laughs> has but somebody that you know wants all the credit has all these ideas about changing the world and very much wants to be the savior of the world and don't forget to spell my name right and then all of a sudden this kryptonian shows up and the attention is on him and he hates it and like you said that xenophobia about him being an alien and like well can we trust him and I and I like it. I think it's an interesting, right. modern, different spin that is more realistic than just blowing his hair off as super. Well, also, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm with you. And I, also, another one is, another one is, he does everything selflessly, so he must be fake. Because Luther, yeah, Luther can't grasp the concept of someone yeah. doing that. Right. Altruistically, yeah. yeah. If someone's if someone appears good, they've got to be a phony. I love it, absolutely, man. You know, have you had these discussions with uh, some of the other writers? Like, you know, I like well, I know Wade gets it. Oh yeah, I talked to Mark, Mark Miller. Gets it. Grant I, does too. Yeah, yeah, he does. He does. Yeah, I think I think that's it. The contrast between Superman's selflessness and his enemy's selfishness is huge. Is there a dragonfly man villain that or a dragonfly villain that could be on the level of of Luther in terms of really knowing what makes this guy tick and that makes him even that much more dangerous? Well, there was number one. You're two, but they're dead. <laughs> I killed them off too soon. But number one was was like on both worlds, like according to their aesthetics. Uh, two different embodiments of, of narcissism, um, which I don't know why I was thinking about narcissism in January of 2017, but I was. What could have been happening? I understand. <laughs> how about uh, how about penultimate? Are you going to go back to any uh, more uh, penultimate stories? I think it's, it feels to me like that story's wrapped up. Um, it ends with him making a decision and it's not a good decision, but at least he's doing something. Is, are there, are there other heroes that you want to explore in Ahoy? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm working on something now I can't talk about, but it, it has to do more with the um, masked pulp hero end of things. Which, uh, Ma massive fan of the, uh, the pre Superman pulp era of the action heroes that we got and everything. Right. Go on. It was like I woke up one day and I thought, what can I do to sell a lot of copies in 
in a commercial sense as usual it's just a disaster but but is there enough of a pocket of people like us tom i understand and I you're right yeah. but but that's the thing like is it is it working is you know i mean I, I I know that again, Wrong Earth, and I can't believe it's been five years, but the amount of buzz you guys got with that in particular, mm -hmm. and a lot of the other things that you do at Ahoy, you know, your cohorts and stuff. I mean, I, I again they're entertaining as hell. But yeah, is it is it is it working out this initiative? I think so. I think so. We're we people uh who are into Ahoy comics really seem to love them. We hear up more and more from people. And uh, is, is the price point of single issues challenging in any way uh do you guys feel like you're you know i mean it, i i don't know you you tell me we we went up to 4.99 a while and it didn't seem to make any difference really but we've gone back down to 3.99 because it just feels like too much to ask at the moment i hear you no absolutely um did covid slow down releasing uh any uh any books oh, it, it really did i mean we there were two months we didn't nobody had a distributor there were no comics and uh there were uh and of course you know everybody went a little crazy it was hard to concentrate and work and stuff and i'm the worst offender in that one in that regard but uh uh so yeah it did it did but it, it's i think it's bounced back pretty much what do you think of the uh, superhero product as far as film and TV that we've been getting lately? Well, I just saw the Marvels trailer, and I really it made me really want to see it. Yeah, uh, it really made me want to see it. it the, the The latest run of Marvel movies do feel a bit small compared to the days when they had Captain America and Iron Man, but I I imagine they'll get out of it. I haven't seen Ant-Man yet because I don't, I still, I'll go to a restaurant now and I'll go to a supermarket without a mask, but I still don't go breathe people's breath for three hours in a theater. <laughs> Are you going to have a mask on at uh, Ithacon, you think, or? Uh... That's going to be a game day decision, I think. So I understand. Yeah. I understand. The numbers are pretty low around here. On the other hand, there's a lot of people there. So. No, I understand, man. Totally. Um, yeah, and I'm kind of with you on uh, the Marvel Phase 4. And again, introducing a lot of characters. Although, ironically, and I know you feel this way as well, it is usually those second and third tier heroes where even more interesting stories are possible. It's true. And the, the casting they've done, like for the new Black Widow and the and the new Hawkeye and stuff, is just sensational. I mean, completely, completely agree. I want to really handle those characters. I really do. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah, I agree with you, man. No, the way um I forget what uh blonde black widow's uh real name is. Uh there are the, the Pugh. she's amazing. Well, I know it's Florence Pugh, the actor, but I was thinking the oh, character. yeah, yeah. The Yolana. Character. I think it's Yolana. Maybe. And uh and no, Haley Stanfield is uh Kate Bishop was just I really blew me away. I had no <laughs> expectations whatsoever, and I'm like, that kid gets it. She and the two of them it. together were, were it was so much fun. Great chemistry. Yeah, man, I'm kind of open for uh, a Falcon Winter Soldier kind of thing with Black Widow and uh, and uh, Kate Bishop Hawkeye. That would be great. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think they've announced a movie that they're in like a team together. I don't, there might be Thunderbolts actually. I'm not sure. Oh, you know, I forgot. I, and I didn't really look at the roster and I hope that's true. That makes sense. Yeah. And I'm so looking forward to more of Julia Louis-Dreyfus as uh, the Countess, as Valentina. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm, uh, no, I think it's a good idea. And also um, uh, John Walker, Captain America, and everything being part of the team is yeah, fun. That is yeah. fun. And I'm psyched for Shield or um, Secret Invasion. I'm psyched for that coming yep. up. That's going to be good. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there you go. Are you? And I forget, Tom, I'm sure I've asked you before because it's my obsession. Are you a Star Trek person? Oh, I love Star Trek. Are but you not. Um, unconditionally there are shows i don't watch <laughs> well there's shows that i don't like but i have to admit i watch everything yeah it's called star trek um are you watching picard season three no i'm not actually i might catch up to it i really never felt good watching picard <laughs> i understand and i would say that truly uh it is a vast improvement of the first two seasons okay good and good. yeah I'll, I'll probably check it out 
Okay. So, yeah. yeah. And especially as we get older and stuff, I kind of like that it's all these characters that are, um, you know, older, older characters and stuff getting it done. And it's not, you know. Yeah. I got to ask you, though. How do you make an android body for your septuagenarian protagonist and not give it super strength? It's bad writing, Tom. That's it's how you do it. Stupid. I've asked you this it before. Yeah. Tom, I don't get the, the the friends that I've made in comics and other areas that are professional writers. And they're like, I don't actually like to Picard season one and two. And I'm like, the plots don't make sense. The characters don't make sense. It was just so embarrassingly bad. And unfortunately, I kind of think this third season of Picard, and it's don't get me wrong, it's got its warts as well. But mm -hmm. I would say overall, it's a good enough show. And unfortunately, when they announced Starfleet Academy, I'm like, I have a bad feeling about this. I don't know, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Strange are you watching New Worlds? Is great. I was gonna say, so you are watching Strange New Worlds. That's I cool. love it. That's the that's the real good one. Although I that last episode where they redid. Uh, Balance of Terror, the first Romulan episode. Yeah. It was like watching high school play kids do do like a high school play version of Balance of Terror. It's like, yeah, you didn't quite get it, man. You didn't quite get the subtleties of that episode, but all right. You know that Next Generation one where Picard um, has an alternate life somewhere with a family and he learns to play the recorder or something? Yes. I, you know, that's one of the greatest, great ones. Obviously. I completely agree. Absolutely. And I went back and watched it just a few years ago and I'm like, this is like community theater. <laughs> this is so terrible. That's fantastic. Oh, see, because I'm like that. Go on. Go on. on the planet are just so stiff, you know. I'm not a Darmok person. And I know people <laughs> who just adore Donna. I'm like that concept of language is met met metaphor is language. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. It's too, uh, you know, whatever. I'm like, all right, whatever. And I love Paul Winfield. You know, I was thrilled that he was back on Star Trek, but I'm like, yeah, not for me. No. It gave us good references to throw around. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. I uh, Are you watching either of the animated shows? Oh, I really like uh, Lower Decks. And I watched the first couple of... Uh, uh, Prodigy. Prodigy, yeah. And it, it was good. I just haven't. There's so much more to watch than... Then there is time to watch it. It's crazy. No, I'm no. behind on Doom Patrol. I am behind on Doom Patrol. This is a good point. Absolutely. How does that happen? <laughs> and I am too. And I <laughs> and Titans as well. I guess the the back end of the last season is back on HBO mm -hmm. Max. While well, it's still called HBO Max. How about right. that bullshit? Jesus Christ. Well, it's like they they so much as said it in these words almost, which is which is if we have the name HBO on it, how do you know we're showing junk too? It's, they want people to know they also have junk. I guess it's it makes no. You're right because really HBO is such a gold standard uh, brand. Yeah, I, I was like, how do I how do I make Word Balloon HBO HBO Word Balloon? Can I do that? <laughs> if you're not going to use the title anymore. I'd be happy to take it. I think people would be uh, very interested in. Wait a minute, HBO. You know. well, the slogan that it's Max, and the slogan the slogan under it is something like "Where you find HBO." <laughs> yeah. We're trying to have it both ways a little. I, but, you know, what I, I really thought. I mean, obviously, AT and T saw the debt, and it's like, all right, let's let's get rid of this as quickly as possible. But when Discovery took over, I don't know why, because I know they do a different kind of television and media in general all the do-it-yourself stuff and everything. But I kind of thought, well, and and again, they're, I'm, I was probably wrong. I assumed that maybe all those uh, do-it-yourself stars of Discovery TV might also be making their cookbooks and their do-it-yourself books through a, a publishing end of Discovery. Mm -hmm. Probably not, maybe not, or whatever. And that they might understand having uh, Warner and DC in particular understanding what you know benefits there are to that stuff I, I don't know i don't know we'll see how they position dc and max yeah i agree with our burrows uh snake saying yeah it feels like uh they're cheapening the brand by yeah. the choice well, they bought, they did that the day they bought it didn't they yeah every yeah. time this company changes hands there's more and more debt 
and it, the debt just becomes is now the complete driver of the whole thing. Yeah, no shit, Jesus. I know it sucks. Uh, that Batgirl movie, we're never going to see it. Um, you know. Yeah. Well, if Elizabeth Warren has her way, you might. Is that the plan? No, it is the plan. They're, 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 her committee's looking into the, the whole deal, and that was one of the things they specified. Was About the the creative yeah. accounting in terms of eating that movie and stuff. That's why she wants to investigate it. it. Well, just the the effect on the people who worked on it, the effect on, uh, yeah, well, there was a lot of emphasis of the effect on the people who work for them. Very Which, strange. By the way, it's a good week to remember that uh, the reality TV is just another name for uh, non-union television. Yes. It's scab TV, and that's what it's for. That's why there was so much of it. It's not because we love it. It's because they could get around unions. Cheaper to make. Yeah, and absolutely. And this uh, this pending writer strike is going to be uh, interesting, and I hope it doesn't last long. But uh, Yeah, me too. Yeah. Ish. Me too. It was awful. That last one, all the talk show hosts came out with beards and told bad jokes terrible i remember it well you're absolutely right about that yeah all the late night guys were writing their own monologues and stuff you're absolutely right about that very funny um are are uh, you know is ahoy pitching any of their concepts to film and television we get nibbles we get nibbles there's a couple of projects we've done that have an option who knows what will come of that and um uh as far as Somebody who goes to Hollywood and just mistreats people until they get their attention. We don't really have anyone like that. I understand, man. Well, we're a week and change from uh, Ithacon, and uh, Ahoy is one of the big signature um, publishers that is a big part of it. Are you doing more than the uh, the Ahoy panel, Tom? Are you doing any other panels? We're going to be at our table a lot. Sure. We're only going to be there Saturday. We're not. Okay. We're not going to take the old man COVID risk of two days there. I understand. And so a week from Saturday, everybody at Ithaca College. Right. It'll be it's, me with uh, Stuart Moore and Hart Steely and Frank Camuso. You're not going to be there? And Jamal Igel and me. Yes. Oh, and you. Okay. No, that's great. Yeah, man. No, that's the core of uh, of Ahoy. And, that, and that's terrific, man. And seriously, it's been great getting to know you. And I mean, I knew Stuart before. I knew Jamal before. And Hart's been incredibly kind to me. You know, uh, everybody, as you know, uh, Ithacon is a sponsor of Ward Balloon. And uh, Ahoy is going to be doing some direct advertising with Word Balloon in the weeks ahead to uh, support the Cornell book and other initiatives as well. So, no, I, I really appreciate that. And, again, swear to God, everybody, full disclosure, yes, they are buying advertising in Word Balloon, but I, I've been a fan of Ahoy's literally from the start, and it's been so great, you know, really getting to know you and getting to know the rest of the guys and everything, man. It so, has been great. It has been great. And you, you wouldn't – you wouldn't promote a product you don't use like Arthur Godfrey. You're like Arthur Godfrey. <laughs> I want to tell you right now, everyone, Lipton tea. Oh, that's amazing. And Julius LaRosa, you're fired. <laughs> Cause you're getting too big. That is I, oh my God. That's what I expected when I said that. The Donald Trump of morning television, essentially like Absolutely. the biggest asshole. And for decades, he held the attention of America and stuff. Oh, well, my he could, God. He could play the ukulele. Yes, he <laughs> And at one point in early TV, as you well know, Tom, the man had three network shows on the air during the week. Three. And, and several of them were daily shows. Yep. So, I mean, this guy really just had an iron grip on, like, American television of the 50s. And, yeah, the guy I mentioned, he had a, it was a variety show, and he had a boy singer on who was getting more and more popular. I think I'm going to cut the legs out of that under that kid. Screw him. <laughs> and that's why you've never heard of Julius La Rosa. That's but, right. Uh, yeah, funny stuff. You're killing me, dude. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right, well, dude, uh, good luck next week. And uh, hey, when you're when you're ready with the new announcement, obviously you're welcome back. You know that. Oh, thank you. That and I want to hear I want to hear about the next project. Absolutely. And you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll spin nostalgia and then talk about uh, old times. I'm always happy to do that with you as well. Yes. Great. Well, thanks, man. Good luck. Good luck next week at Ithacon, and uh, I know I'm gonna be talking to a few more Ahoy people as we get closer to next Saturday and Sunday for Ithacon. So, uh, 
everyone should check it out. There are, the commercials are running on the audio version of the show, so uh, definitely uh, be a part of it. Thanks, John. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, it's a busy day on Word Balloon. I have uh, I was at Illinois State University uh, helping them out with a few student activities, and uh, I suddenly realized, oh, I, I make commitments for interviews. So I got Tom right now. Later today, 6 p.m. Eastern time, I've got Dan DiDio coming on, talking about his new young adult book and Frank Miller Presents Comics. And uh, later on as well, I'm going to have a great uh, conversation with uh, a new creator who has a very cool Western slash noir book, a modern Western noir cool. that I look forward to talking about. So, yeah, we're going to do that at 10 o'clock Eastern time. So, uh, the yeah, the uh, the clock never stops here at wordballoon.com, but uh, happy to do it. And truly, man, as always, happy to talk to you. So thank you. Talking to you. So you just show up when there's like an emergency, like Steve Luckner, you know who he is? No, is that like a radio like guy that runs to the series? Uh, has a YouTube channel called Agenda Free TV. And what he does is when there's a big breaking news story, he goes down and you see him at his desk with his computer and he just goes searching all over the internet for details and tells you what they are. And you can watch him doing this. And Live. He will be, if the story's big enough, he'll do this for like six hours. Wow. It's fantastic to watch. What's his name again? It's uh, Steve Luckner, L-O-K-N-E-R, and his uh, channel is called Agenda Free TV, which made me think it was really right wing, but it isn't. Interesting. He just All right. tries to do straight news, and I read up on it. Turns out he's like a former Saturday Night Live writer from like the nineties or something. That's excellent. No, God. No. All right. So Agenda I, Free. The next time there's like a huge news story, go look for it. It's I will. Really no, good recommend. There you go, Tom. Awesome. Good recommendation. I appreciate All right. that. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll uh, reconvene at 6 Eastern time with Dan DiDio. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.